So in the previous videos, we talked about algebraic functions and how if we're given x, we can find y, and if we're given y, how we can find x in the algebraic setting. Now, an important question related to you know, finding x and y coordinates is, what is the total set of x coordinates? What is the total set of y coordinates? That is, how does one find the domain and range of an algebraic function? Well, it turns out the answer about range is a little bit tricky. It kind of depends on the family of functions. And as we study different families of functions this semester, we'll be able to answer questions about, do, about range forthcoming, right? So polynomials, we apply one thing. Radicals will say another thing. Exponentials will say another thing. So we'll approach questions about range on a future day. That's, that's a little bit more sophisticated, for, too, too, too much for us right now. But we are in a position where we can talk about the domain of a function. And so when a function is defined algebraically, we're going to follow the following domain convention. If a function is given by an algebraic expression and the domain is not stated explicitly. So this would be like saying something like, well, f of x equals 2x plus 5. You know, they, they tell you this is the function, but they don't specify what the domain is. If ever I want to specify the domain, I can tell you like, oh, okay, the domain is when x is greater than or equal to 0. I can make that specification. Or I might say something like the domain of f is equal to 0 to infinity. Same thing right there. I could specifically tell you it, but if it's not told, if the domain is implicit, that is, we're just supposed to infer from the formula what the domain is, we follow the following convention. The convention is that the domain is the set of all real numbers for which the expression makes sense and defines a real number in its unsimplified form. Um, and so if a function, of course, is given by a graph or table, then the domain is all of those numbers represented on the graph or table. We've talked about that before, but for an algebraic function, we have to then infer what makes sense here given the formula. So assuming X is a real number, is there a real number that we cannot multiply by two? The answer is no, we can multiply any number by two. Can we add five to any number? We can. And so as such, there's no restriction on the real number X right here. So the domain would be all real numbers which in interval notation, you'll write this as negative infinity to infinity right here. Or as a shortcut for that, you can write this double R. This is short for all real numbers. And for many functions, that's what it's going to be. We want the domains to be as big as possible. Uh, and so we just want to infer what's the largest domain possible given this formula. Now, at this time in the course, there's only going to be two concerns that are going to show up that might restrict the domain of an algebraically defined function. There'll be some more we add later, but for the moment, we have concerns of the following nature. If you take the square root of negative one, or in fact, if you take the square root of any, any negative number, um, this actually gives you an imaginary number. We'll talk about imaginary numbers more in the future uh, when we have, we will have a lesson about complex numbers, what have you. But if you get an imaginary number, I should mention that this is not a real number. And so this would violate the domain convention because the domain convention says that the number that comes out has to be a real number. So if you take the square root of negative, that's not going to be a real number. So it, it's not going to work. We'll, we might relax that condition later, but for now, no. -uh. Uh, another problem you have to look out for is division by zero. Now, unlike the complex number system, division by zero really cannot be resolved. Uh, the consequences of allowing division by zero are, are too strenuous. It would destroy our algebra. Uh, I'm not kidding about that. It, would, it really would devastate the algebraic system. Uh, we, we can't allow division by zero. And I want to give you just a, sort, a short little argument why that was. Suppose we did allow division by zero. Let's pick our two favorite numbers, right? I'm looking at the clock. We are four minutes into the video and today is let's see my calendar is september 1st so i'm going to prove to you we're going to prove that four equals one right and so here's here's the proof of that statement start off with something which we know is true zero equals zero great no one could deny that one uh next well zero is the same thing as zero times four because anything times zero is four uh, sorry anything anything times zero is zero right and zero is also zero times one. Great, so still true, nothing wrong with that, right? But take this equation again, and if we were allowed to divide by zero, then we could divide both sides by zero, and we would get, we would get four equals one, la 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 la, and then the argument's over with, right? So we've now proven that four equals one using this erroneous arithmetic 
of division by zero. If we allow division by zero, we would have to we would have to allow that four equals one. But why just stop there? We would have that any number is equal to one. We'd have any numbers equal to zero. And that would be a very depressing number system, wouldn't we? You wake up at zero hundred hours in the morning. Um, you look at your bank account, you have zero dollars. Uh, you go on Facebook, you have zero friends. You have to drive to school and you're going zero miles per hour. It would be a very impractical number system where every number is zero. So if we want there to be non-zero numbers, we cannot allow division by zero. And it's because of this dominance property of zero. When you multiply by zero, you always get back zero. And because of that, we can't negate multiplication of zero, which is what division is all about. So look out for division by zero. And so using the domain convention, let's look at the following functions and determine what their domains would be. So when you look at this first one, this is an example of a polynomial function. You have some multiplication, five times x, exponents, x squared, which just means x times x. You have addition. Uh, and so this doesn't have any of the problems we, we have to worry about. There's no square roots involved. There's no division. And so by default, your domain, the domain of f right here, is going to be all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity written in interval notation. That's all there is to it. Now, with example b right here, the function g of x is defined as the square root of x plus 2. Because this is a square root function, we do have to be cautious that make sure that x plus 2 is not negative. And so because the radicand, that's the expression inside of the radical there, it's not an evolution of radicate or anything like that. The radicand has to be non-negative. So we have to solve the inequality x plus 2 is greater than or equal to 0. We'll talk some more about solving inequalities in the future, but this one's pretty mild. Um, it's very much like solving a linear equation. You just have to remember to flip the sign if you ever multiply or divide by a negative. So subtracting two from both sides, we end up with x needs to be greater than or equal to negative two. Now, this is greater than or equal to. Notice if you take x to be negative two, g of negative two is actually equal to the square root of negative two plus two, which is the square root of zero. There's no worries about taking the square root of zero. The square root of zero is itself zero, which is a real number. Negative two is inside the domain. And in fact, the domain of g right here is going to be an interval notation, negative two to infinity. And make sure that negative two is included in that. You want to bracket because evaluating the function negative two does give us a, a real number there. So when you have square roots, you're going to have to make sure that all radicands present are uh, non-negative. On example C right here, we have x over x squared minus x. Because this is a fraction, in fact, this is a, what we call a rational function. Uh, it's a ratio between two polynomials. We have to make sure that the denominator is not equal to zero. That's the thing that gives us pause right here. And so by doing this, we basically want to solve the equation uh, x squared minus x is not equal to zero. But of course, setting, solving the equation not equal to zero is basically the same thing as solving equal to zero. So if you want to solve the equation equal to zero, that's fine. You just need to remember that the answers you find will then be the things not in the domain. Uh, so if you want to solve this one, uh, factoring makes a good technique. It is a quadratic polynomial, so you could like complete the square or use the quadratic formula. Again, these are all techniques that we will review in the future as we study in depth more about quadratic equations. But it's very likely you've seen some of these things before. Uh, by a very simple factoring technique, you just factor out the greatest common divisor between x squared and x. You can factor out the x that leaves behind an x minus 1. And that the only way that a product of two real numbers is going to equal zero is if one of the factors was zero. This would give us that either x equals zero or x minus one equals zero, which solving the second equation tells us that x equals one. These are the numbers zero and one will make the denominator go to zero. And these are the only numbers that will make the denominator go to zero. And therefore, these are the only numbers that are forbidden from the domain. So the domain of h, we might say something like the following. We want all, all real numbers x such that x is not equal to 0 or 1. Uh, we can describe the domain using the set builder notation because it's much easier to list the two exceptions than it is to list every number that's allowed. But, it, but in interval notation, this would look like negative infinity up to 0, parenthesis, union 0 to 1, again, parentheses here, and then union 1 to infinity. You could write in an interval notation, interval notation that way. And we're just saying we want all real numbers except for 0 and 1. Do make sure you put parentheses by the 0 and the 1 because they are not included in the domain. 
because it makes the denominator go to zero. And also make sure you put parentheses by infinity and minus infinity, because as those are real numbers, they cannot be included inside of the domain. Only numbers are allowed there, real numbers. And so as one last example of this uh, domain convention, let's find the domain of the function capital F of X equals the square root of three X plus 12 over X minus five. Now, one thing I do want to mention that you'll notice here, this is capital F as opposed to lowercase f. When it comes to mathematics, uh, mathematics is case sensitive. If I write a capital F, that does not mean lowercase f. And if I write a lowercase f, that does not mean capital F. Um, in this situation, it really wouldn't matter if I called it lowercase f, but make sure that you do use capitals when you're supposed to and lowercase ones when you're supposed to. Because there are many situations which the lowercase and uppercase letter of the same, the same alphabetic letter could show up in the formula together. And those mean two different things. So do pay attention to that. Now with this function, D, uh, uh, capital F right here, for example, D, there's two potential problems. Uh, the first one comes from division by zero, right? So if you look at the denominator, you have this X minus five, we have to figure out when X minus five equals zero, we'll add five to both sides, you get X equals five, right? And so this is the exception, we don't want X to equal five. That's one problem with the domain. Another potential problem from the domain comes from the radical in the numerator, right? Um, we have the square root of 3x plus 12. So that concern means that if we're going to be a well-defined real number, we need to take 3x plus 12 and set it greater than or equal to 0 and solve that equation. Uh, minus 12 from both sides. Uh, we'll write that out there. So we want to subtract 12 from both sides. The 12s cancel on the left-hand side. This gives us 3x is greater than or equal to negative 12. Divide both sides by 3. The threes would cancel on the left-hand side. We then get that X is gonna be greater than or equal to negative four. And so we have sort of two things we, we have to consider in order to get the domain. X has to be greater than or equal to negative four to make the numerator a real number. And the denominator cannot be five. Um, otherwise we divide it by zero. And so when we put these things together, right, we have to take, we have to take the intersection of these things, right? The intersection. We have to look at the overlap between x is greater than or equal to negative 4 and x doesn't equal 5. And so this tells us that the domain of capital F is going to be negative 4 up to 5, parentheses. So we have a bracket on the negative 4, a parenthesis on the 5, union 5 to infinity, where again we have a parenthesis on the 5. That's because 5 is not allowed inside the domain, but negative 4 is allowed in the domain because negative 4 would make the numerator go to 0 and it would make the denominator go to negative 9. 0 over negative 9 is 0. That's, that's a number there. That's, that's not a problem. And so this shows us how we can determine the domain of an algebraically defined function. Uh, and so square roots of negatives and division by 0 are the things we have to look out for. Like I said, there will be some problems that will appear in the future as we learn about some other function families. But for a good while, these are the only ones we have to worry about as we try to determine the domain of an algebraically defined function.